Hi, this is Craig Stocks here for Utah Desert Remote Observatories. Uh, we would love to host your remote telescope under our dark skies in southwest Utah. And what I want to talk about today is the concept of non-destructive editing, in particularly in Photoshop. Yeah, I guess two reasons. One, uh, I tend to see a lot of videos on YouTube that say they're using non-destructive techniques, and then they immediately begin doing things that at least the way I learned, uh, are very destructive. So let me talk a little bit about my workflow and what I consider a non-destructive workflow, and then I'll show you a couple examples of what that is and why it can be so useful. So my basic processing workflow, uh, I stack my lights and calibration frames in PixInsight. Uh, I've switched to PixInsight a couple months ago. And basically I use it to also stretch those integrated uh, master images that PixInsight produces. A lot of times I'll just do a simple screen transfer function stretch and apply it with the uh, histogram transformation. Other times I will explore using the uh, arc sine h stretch and sometimes I'll just use levels and or curves and kind of do it manually the old school way. But my, my goal is to get something that I can save as a 16-bit TIFF and then bring into Photoshop. And Photoshop is where I like to do all of my uh, channel combination, color mapping, uh, overall tuning. Uh, I find it much easier to work in Photoshop. And in particular for color mapping, uh, it lets me explore different color palettes visually rather than mathematically using something like pixel math. Uh, and then I almost always refine and do the final crop in Lightroom. And part of the reason is I may change the crop for different purposes. Uh, for, you know, for instance, printing versus sharing online. Uh, to share online, I just simply export it as a JPEG from Lightroom. If I want to print it, I will open it as a PSD. And probably most importantly to a non-destructive workflow, if I find something I want to change, then I can open the original from Lightroom, make those edits, and when I go back to Lightroom, then those new edits are reflected in the, the version that's shown. So let's talk about what non-destructive editing is and isn't. In general, I would say a, a layer-based non-destructive workflow means maintaining layers and adjustment layers intact uh, so that you can go back to the very beginning and make a change and it's reflected all the way through to the finished image. Uh, I try to never make a change that I can't go back and change or undo later. Uh, you know, I may want to change the way I applied a, a levels adjustment, for instance. Generally, I would say I don't care about file size. Uh, I usually save my images as a .psb, which is Photoshop's large file format. Uh, at the time I put this together, I was using an old five-year-old laptop with 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, I have a newer laptop now, but it was really driven more by PixInsight than by Photoshop. But bottom line is I almost never flatten a file or even merge layers. I always keep all the, the layers intact. So as a comparison, destructive editing, if you're applying adjustments like curves, levels, uh, color directly to a layer, that's destructive. The non-destructive approach is to use an adjustment layer. Uh, anytime you merge layers, that's destructive. You're actually changing those pixels and you can't unchange them. So you need to keep individual layers intact. Uh, when I see people duplicate a layer, that's almost always the start of, an, of a destructive step. Uh, and I do sometimes duplicate layers for specific purposes. Uh, some things you almost have to duplicate layers. But if you really are using a non-destructive workflow, you can use a smart object instead of duplicating a layer most of the time and get the same benefits. And as I mentioned before, flattening an image is always destructive. Uh, so I virtually never flatten an image. And just to look at a few examples, if I switch to Photoshop, if we look at this, this photo, it's just on a single layer. If I decide I want to brighten this, what I see a lot of people do is go directly to image adjustments levels and brighten it up. 
and then click OK. And I have just changed those pixels. The math was done. It calculated new values. It's not something that you can undo later. If I save this file and come back to it later, those changes are baked right in here. So let me go back in history to the original. Another thing I see people do is duplicate the layer, which you can do by dragging it down to the new layer icon or use the keyboard shortcut control J and then apply those adjustments to this duplicated layer. And it feels non-destructive because you can say, well, I've kept the original intact. I have kept the original intact, but I can't go back to that levels adjustment and change my mind about some of the values that I put in. So they are baked into this copy. So now I just have two copies of the, of the, the original. So again, let's go back to the start. What you should do for a non-destructive workflow, if you go through the image adjustments, right below this is adjustment layers. I'm sorry, it's under layer. New adjustment layer. And let's choose levels. And it will ask for a name. We'll just use levels one. And you'll see what happens is it creates a new layer over here in the layer palette. That's an adjustment layer. You can tell by the little yin yang black and white symbol here. And in the properties window, I can see the settings for that levels adjustment. And I can do just like I did before. I can change the values here and I can see the changes reflected in the image. I can zoom in, zoom out. Uh, there are some, kind of bugs in Photoshop where sometimes it won't show the the effect correctly unless you zoom into at least something like 75%. Uh, but that's normally not a problem. The advantage of this is I can make my changes and let's say I decide to really brighten this up and that's probably brightened up too much. You know, it's even dark in the background and maybe I initially think that looks good. So I save this file the advantage of non-destructive, if I save this as a TIFF with layers intact or as a PSD or a PSB Photoshop file, when I reopen it, it will open just like this with this layer, adjustment layer still here and these settings still there. So if I look at it tomorrow and say, oh, I really crushed the blacks. I need to not darken the blacks so much and not brighten the whites so much and maybe be a little bit more gentle with the midtones. I never changed any of the pixels in the background layer. All I did was change the math that was done for display purposes so that I could see the change, but the change was never baked into the pixels. So in fact, I could darken it like this, save it, reopen it tomorrow, and change this back and everything comes back just the way it was. That's kind of the essence of a non-destructive workflow. If I, if I flatten or merge these layers, now it's destructive. Now I can't come back and change my mind tomorrow. And I do find I change my mind tomorrow a lot. Sometimes just, you know, 10 minutes later, I'll look at something in more detail and realize I, I missed something that I should have corrected earlier in the process. And a good example of that is earlier today, I posted an image of the elephant trunk nebula. And it's kind of a twofold lesson in non-destructive workflow. The original was this version in the uh, Hubble color palette of SHO, but I knew it was saved with all the layers intact. So I still had all the original sulfur, hydrogen, and, and oxygen data as I brought it in from PixInsight. So as I wanted to explore a different color palette, I could simply open this original file from Lightroom and then make those changes to the color mapping and save it with a new name rather than starting over. And this was the result I ended up with. And I didn't notice at the time, but if you look at the details here in the, uh, the yellow part of the nebula, there's a lot of red noise that I'm not sure if this is is noise from hot pixels. It could, it almost looks like walking noise. Uh, so perhaps I didn't dither enough, uh, but 
I need to fix that. And that's pretty early back in the process. So let's see how I can fix that with a non-destructive workflow. And again, this was saved with all the layers intact. So let's hop back over to Photoshop. And I already have this open. And what I did was basically in Lightroom, uh, go to, I would usually just use the shortcut control E for edit and choose edit original. And when I do that, then it opens this image in Photoshop, which is the original with all the layers intact. And yes, this is a big file. But if we look at where this noise is coming from, the first thing I need to do is decide, is it coming from the hydrogen, the oxygen, or the sulfur? And easiest way to do that is just to turn the layers off one at a time and see if the problem goes away. So it didn't go away with hydrogen. Let's turn off the sulfur. Uh, that did make it go away. Let's check the oxygen. And so actually the problem is in the sulfur, not the, uh, not the oxygen. So let's open up this layer group for sulfur. And you can see here is the sulfur layer that I brought in from uh, PixInsight. And then there's, looks like some adjustments here on a, uh, a pixel bearing layer and then a levels adjustment to to make it darker if we look at the levels adjustment it's it's pulling in the darks and brightening the whites a little bit but in that process it really brought out this noise so in order to fix this the simplest solution is probably going to be to apply some form of a blur either a, a, a dust and scratches filter or possibly even just a a blur to this layer. And the first thing I would typically try and would be the dust and scratches. Now, those filters are destructive. So this is a case where I might choose to duplicate this layer and apply the filter. The other option, the more non-destructive approach would be to right click and convert this to a smart object. It'll still look just the same the advantage, though, is I can apply filters non-destructively. So I can go to Filter, and let's try Dust and Scratches first, and try applying it with a fairly large radius. And that, that isn't really fixing it. And so let's just cancel that. And actually, I'm still not convinced that this is in the sulfur and not the oxygen. Let me check the oxygen again. Ah, it is in the it is in the oxygen. So let's switch to the oxygen. It looks very much the same. I'm going to make this a smart object. And let's try the uh, noise dust and scratches filter and see if it improves it or gets rid of it. This is at a fairly large radius of 21 pixels. Uh, and that does get rid of it. So let's try a smaller radius. And the objective would be to find the smallest radius that you can use that solves the problem. There's 18 pixels. Looking at the preview, the little preview window up here. It looks like around 14 pixels will solve the problem. So I can apply that. The advantage of that is if I look at this and I decide that, well, that had, you know, some detrimental effect somewhere else, I can change the settings of dust and scratches. And I also have a mask that I can mask it out. I can also change the blending mode. So let's just turn this, this filter on and off. I can use the the little visibility eyeball here to turn the dust and scratches filter off and on. And I can just kind of flip back and forth to see if it's causing any other problems. And it doesn't look like it is. It looks like it's getting rid of those, those little dots without any other problems. So if I had 
done this in a more destructive workflow by you know applying things flattening merging and so forth i would have had to basically go all the way back to the start in order to fix that problem and you can see all of the things that were done after the basic color mapping so let me just talk through the rest of this file because it it does have some interesting information in how it's put together uh, and i'm just going to turn off all of these layers then we'll turn them back on one by one so this is the in this rgb at the bottom is not used for anything you can just ignore that so basically i have three layer groups one for hydrogen one for sulfur and one for oxygen and the two upper ones sulfur and oxygen are are where i do my color mapping by using the uh, layer blending options so if i double click on this sulfur layer group out here to the right of the name in the blank area that will open the layer style options and if you look at the blending options which is the kind of the default option when this first opens in the center of the panel you can see the channels and it has r g and b and you'll notice that r is unchecked what that means is this layer group is only contributing green and blue and that means that what's below it is contributing the red so just by changing this checkbox i have made it a uh, ho or hss image where hydrogen is red and sulfur is contributing green and blue oxygen at the top of the stack if we look at it, it's only contributing green, but notice in the blending mode, the default for this would be pass-through, which is the same as normal. And what pass-through does is it lightens where it's lighter and darkens where it's darker, which creates all of this magenta, which is the opposite of green. And I don't like that. I liked the way the rest of it looked without all of this magenta. So by changing this to lighten blending mode, where the oxygen is lighter than what's below, it shows up as kind of an orange yellow, which is green and red mixed. And everywhere else, it lets the rest of it shine through. So that's how I get the, the H S plus O S version of the data to start with. And then I have a whole series of adjustment layers where I apply curves and then hue saturation, another hue saturation, color balance, another hue saturation, levels again to brighten that up, a soft light layer where I did some burning and dodging to brighten and darken kind of local areas. This layer is an interesting one. This is a solid fill layer set at a fairly dark gray in this case just like a 19 values of red green and blue and what i do is put this in lighten blending mode and let me turn it on and what it does is create a basically a floor level so that nothing will be darker than that uh, 19 19 19. If I turn it on and off, you don't see a lot of difference, but you see the, the dark areas get lifted to that plain solid 19, 19, 19. And generally after I create it, then I will come back and play with how, how dark do I want it to be? Because if I make it too bright, it starts to lighten dark areas with detail. If I make it too dark, then it lets dark areas with noise show through. So it's it's kind of a matter of playing with it visually to find just the right level where it it creates a, a floor and evens out the blacks, but doesn't obliterate any detail. Then the last thing I have on the top is a layer with just the stars. And these are typically extracted using Star Exterminator in PixInsight. And I can turn the stars on and off to create either a, uh, a starry layer or a starless version. So that's kind of in a nutshell how I did my editing. 
uh, how I did the color balance, and more importantly, the value of having a non-destructive workflow because when I found a mistake or you know something that I missed very early in the process, I could easily go back and fix it without having to, to recreate everything else in between. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, be sure to drop them in the comments below. Uh, if you really found it useful, be sure to, uh, to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. And I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under a clear, dark sky. Thanks.